anesthesiologists and intensivists across Europe and around the world are providing essential, life-saving care that has an impact on all areas of medicine. In 2020, the importance of working as a unified global community to maintain the very highest standards of practice and patient safety grow ever more clear. Now, this community is coming together virtually to enhance knowledge, catch up on innovative techniques and learn the latest guidelines. It's Euro Anesthesia 2020, and we're Euro Anesthesia TV. Welcome back to Euro Anesthesia TV and day two of Euro Anesthesia 2020. With experts from across the fields of anesthesiology, intensive care, pain and perioperative medicine, this is the virtual place to be, to pick up the very latest knowledge, guidelines and techniques. On today's show, stand by for a visit to Kazakhstan's National Research Cardiac Surgery Centre. Take a look at 10 years of the Helsinki Declaration and get an update from Professor Mark Samama on the European Journal of Anesthesiology. In addition, make sure to come with us to Barcelona's Vidabron Hospital and discuss gender equity at Ezeig with Professor Wojslava Leskovic. One of the real highlights in the Euro Anesthesia meeting is the pro-con debates, where experts take on two sides of an important issue in anesthesiology. Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Imran Ahmad and Dr. Daniela Godaroja, who will be addressing the question, does my patient need awake intubation? Thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Sam. Now, Dr. Ahmad, let me start with you because you're in the pro corner. Why is it ever necessary to do awake intubation? If you expect the patient to have a difficult airway or difficult intubation, not just, not just a difficult intubation, but maybe difficult airway management in general, then, uh, then traditionally teaching has been that we, we manage the airway awake. Uh, and, um, and, and data shows that actually if you put the patient to sleep when you expect it to be difficult, then you're more likely to run into trouble. And, and, and therefore, uh, you know, we, we, we teach uh, and, and we, we learn that uh, if you expect it to be difficult, then the gold standard should ideally be managing the patient awake. I'm sure uh, Daniela may, may disagree with that. Well, well, let's find out, Dr. Godaroja, because you're taking the comp perspective. Do you think that uh, awake intubation should ever be used and when should it definitely not be used? Of course I used. And of course it should be used exactly as uh, Inrat said. There are still some circumstances uh, where uh, should not be used this, uh, uh, this um, uh, technique. This is a procedure that needs time to prepare it. So when um, uh, the life of the patient is uh, put in the difficult, in an in a, in emergency, so the patient will not survive if you don't take immediately measure. We need to uh, go for uh, other other type intubation directly. So, and this is this is the position of cardiac arrest, for example. But of course, uh, uh, this is a technique that every anesthetist should uh, should uh, uh, master. If you ask me, Dr. Ahmed, do you set the limits a little more broadly? I mean, what factors aren't we considering here? Uh, so one of the, um, the the key factors about doing awake intubations is actually it's not done as often as it should do, and, and we know from from data from published work that that people that anesthetists avoid doing an awake intubation when they probably should have done it, um, and, and therefore then and they've gone on to run into trouble. So the experience, the training, the the equipment, um, the, the timing, all these sort of factors are also need to be taken into consideration. When you're doing an awake intubation, it's not just about the patient and whether the patient has an anticipated difficult airway. Just before we finish, it would be great if we could talk quickly about COVID-19. Has this affected um, your stance on this issue? I think if there is an indication for awake intubation, it should be kept and should be taken, the procedure. Uh, of course, the um, extra measures for, uh, for uh, reducing the aerosolized um, uh, in that, those patients and to protect the staff is very important. So this, this is the key issue, how, how we organize, how to do the step-by-step -step the procedure. Dr. Godaroja, Dr. Ahmad, thank you both for joining us and thank you for such an informative discussion. Thank you very thank much. You, 
some great insights there into a key skill for anesthesiologists everywhere. Now let's head to Kazakhstan and Central Asia's leading research institute, National Research Cardiac Surgery Centre. Euroanesthesia TV is brought to you from the fully virtual Euroanesthesia 2020, featuring interviews with key speakers and updates about the scientific programme presented in this meeting. We've also travelled the world to bring you insights into the global field of anesthesiology and intensive care. You'll find us on the virtual meeting platform as well as online and on social media. We'll bring you a new episode each day of the meeting and make sure to click through for much more. Now, 10 years ago, the Helsinki Declaration established a renewed focus on patient safety across the medical fields in Europe. This year, as we celebrate that anniversary, we caught up with some experts who've played a key role in making it happen and take a look back on the changes that have been achieved so far. It was actually the political branch of European anesthesiology, the European board, who started the work on the Helsinki Declaration. But in order to have good politics, you need good scientific background. And that is why the European society was involved. And that has proven so smart for both the development and then the continuing work and distribution of uh, the declaration. As soon as the declaration has been signed, we started working on various tools to help spread the message. So in the time after the launch, we published a book on patient safety, emergency, emergency checklists, a template for a departmental safety report, podcasts, editable basic PowerPoint lectures and so on. All that content then was put together on a USB stick and given for free to Euroanesthesia participants and also was set on the either web page for unlimited download. Word then quickly spread and it caught the desire for improving patient safety amongst the global family of anesthesiologists. Soon numerous national societies wished to adopt it, setting up their own signing ceremonies. And I must pay tribute to Janica, who travelled around the world to attend these meetings, spread the declaration safety message and made this all such an outstanding success. Our evaluation of the role of the Declaration in Patient Safety in European Anesthesiology found that many of its requirements, such as the use of monitoring and protocols, were widely adopted throughout the continent. Departments could, however, make more of the departmental annual patient safety report if they wished. My favourite quote from the project was a description of the Helsinki Declaration as an arrow pointing somewhere. To me, that sums up the vision perfectly. An arrow pointing to safety, to the future. I believe that Helsinki Declaration for the future has to be more inclusive, if we can, including more disciplines in our consensus to improve patient safety in all the perioperative and intensive care period and also including more concepts that maybe 10 years ago were not as important as we can see them now, like hyperthermia or um, professional well-being for uh, proper uh, patient safety. That is how I see patient safety in the future. That is patient safety. That is 
a single decoration. Looking forward to what the next 10 years bring for patient safety. Next, the European Journal of Anesthesiology provides anesthesiologists with the very latest research in the field. We caught up with the new Editor-in-Chief, Professor Mark Samama, to find out what's new and what's coming up soon. The European Journal uh, of Anesthesiology uh, belongs to uh, the European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. And with this new name, uh, the, the ASAIC has asked uh, our team and myself to develop uh, intensive care in the journal. So we will have more room for intensive care and also especially for perioperative medicine. I just recently started the job of editor-in-chief, uh, mid-September, so very recently, one month ago, and I'm very happy to uh, uh, have the opportunity to lead a, a very nice team. I'm very excited to be able to uh, develop the journal and to, uh, to uh, put it among the best journal in anesthesiology. Our eight new deputy editors are involved in uh, uh, several fields, uh, either anesthesia, intensive care, perioperative medicine, obstetrics, pediatrics and pain. They are well-known physicians, uh, they are high-ranking professors in Europe and I expect that they will uh, promote the quality of the journal. We need to make this journal more visible either uh, by the quality of the article by increasing the number of guidelines, reviews, and also uh, by uh, uh, pushing this journal on the social networks and uh, increasing its visibility. We plan to develop a second journal, 100% open access, which name will be European Journal of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. And this journal will welcome a manuscript which wouldn't have been accepted at first time in the uh, European Journal of Anesthesiology, but for sure its impact factor will also grow very quickly. Well, good luck to Professor Samama in that new role. Now let's go to Barcelona and Vidabron Hospital. Staff there are at the very forefront of research and clinical care in everything from pain management to paediatrics. Our 120 faculty members and 45 residents are dedicated to providing the highest quality anesthesia care. People are the reason we exist, and the patient is always at the heart of the work we do. Championing equity, ASAIC has established a Gender Equity Committee, and here to discuss the role of that committee, I'm delighted to be joined by the Chair, Professor Wojtyla Neskovic. Professor Neskovic, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, it's my pleasure to join you. Uh, I wonder if we could start then by talking about what the big challenges are facing gender equity today. Now, healthcare system is delivered by women and run by men because, uh, generally speaking, 75% of healthcare workers are women and they hold only 25% of leadership positions. So, what is the committee then? How is it run and, and what will it do? We are, uh, let's say, a, a group of people that's supposed to come up with some action plan uh, that can make um, 
uh, not only raise uh, uh, the awareness of, uh, of gender equity, but also uh, to inspire a culture, culture of change. Uh, towards equality so that every anesthesiologist can fulfill their individual professional goals. What would you like to achieve in the short and the long term? What we want to do and what we need to do is uh, to support education and uh, to develop leadership programs uh, to find uh, women role models that uh, will be able to inspire and support and motivate other women and uh, also to show that uh, at the end of the day, when you have the um, best people on the um, adequate positions, we may also hope for a better quality of care and improvement of our profession. It sounds like a very exciting future, Voika. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Such great work there from Mosaic's Gender Equity Committee. Do make sure to get involved. Well, that brings us to the end of our second show here at Euro Anesthesia 2020. Join us tomorrow for plenty more, though, as we speak to Dr. Frederick Misha about the latest in artificial intelligence and hear what's new from the members of the Mosaic Trainee Committee. We'll see you then.